So it's time for another installment of our landscape photography season here on iPhotography. So this is Stephen and Chris this week, and we're talking about something a little bit different. We've been talking about lifestyles and practical ways of being able to make yourself a better landscape photographer. I've got a professional with us. Um, this is Chris Sale, if you've not joined any of our previous uh, episodes before. Uh, and Chris, you kind of swear by the value of photography projects, don't you? Yeah, I do, Stephen. It's something that I've um, I've got into reasonably recently, um, but uh, I think that you know it does give us so many opportunities to to try different things. And I think photography projects are, if you're if you're a photographer who is looking for some fresh inspiration or a fresh challenge, I do think that projects are an excellent way of getting that. Yeah, and and it's just, I mean. Speaking in generalities, this doesn't have to be a landscape project by any means, but the focus of our chat, given Chris's expertise, will be on landscapes. Because looking back, I think previously one of our earlier um, podcast shows, we did talk about how to kind of find time in your day and make time for yourself a little bit to start a project uh, and what you know you can do at home, etc. But this is going to be kind of focused a little bit more on uh, landscape photography, given Chris's experience. So, I mean. Let's say for those listening who've never done a photography project, what does it entail? So I think you know at its very core, at the very basic level, a, a photography project is is really just a collection of photographs that are based around a central theme. They they have something that connects them uh, together, and I think if we look a little bit beyond that, there are often there's often a purpose. For a project uh, often a, the project has something to say it has an end goal it's trying to achieve that be that awareness about a particular issue or to draw people's attention to a particular place i mean i remember that we've talked previously about some of your photography projects i think i want to say it's the hand of man was that the title of it so Is the hand that- the hand of man was really the first project that I started as a landscape as a professional landscape photographer um, and the the idea behind that was to show man's relationship with the Lake District which is the which is the area that I photograph and the the Lake District is is recognized by UNESCO as a world heritage site now we, we achieved world heritage uh, status uh, only a few years ago um, but the uh, UNESCO awarded us that distinction because of the relationship that man has had in sculpting this landscape. The Lake, the Lake District is by far a, a natural landscape, as you would you would think. It's it's been uh, shaped over the years by agriculture, by uh, mining and, and quarrying and uh, and that sort of thing, and more latterly by the tourist trade. And what I wanted to do was to um, you know, create a series of images a project that really celebrated that relationship i think what we'll do if um for the youtube version of this podcast the visual version is that if i can borrow some of chris's images from his project we'll kind of intersperse them um at that point as well so you can actually have a look a little bit more uh, closely as to what it is but we'll also put a, a link in the bio um of this podcast so you can jump on are they on your website chris or on your Instagram? so the, i think the, probably the thing to point out about that project is unfortunately it was interrupted <laughs> by covid um and uh, i got to a position where i'd started work on it and then COVID came along and I wasn't actually physically able to travel into the Lake District uh, because I live on the outskirts. And so uh, that project is actually currently on hold. But I do have another, I am working on another project at the minute. We can talk about that if you like. Yeah, yeah, by all means. I mean, what 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 else do you do you can you've been working through? So the the the, the project, my twenty twenty one project, which r- is running from January till the end of December, um, is titled 12 Significant Photos, and it's very much inspired by a quote by Ansel Adams, uh, who said that uh, 12 significant photos in any one year is a good crop. And I wanted to explore um, what would happen if I really dedicated myself to capturing just 12 images, just the 12 best images that I possibly could. That was the original concept behind the project. And I wanted to challenge myself and I, I wanted to, to sort of base it in the Lake District. And I, at the time, I was doing a lot of uh, photography down by the edges of the lakes. And I wanted to force myself to get up into the mountains more and do more sort of mountain photography. So I, 
I chose 12 locations. Um, and then I was going to dedicate my year to those 12 locations. And the idea was to try to capture 12 images that told the story of those locations and how the Lake District changes through the seasons. And so the idea was to try to capture an image for, well, for, for these 12 locations, one for each month of the year. Um, and to continually revisit those locations and to see how they change throughout the year. Of course, that was also interrupted by COVID. <laughs> um, so what then happened was I, mass I changed the scope and uh, I decided to base the project in the immediate area around where I live. And so I chose, uh, I live in a village called, uh, if people are familiar with Cumbria, with like, I live in a village called Shap. And um, Shap sits on the eastern edge of the Lake District National Park, the, the boundary butts right up against us. And Shap has two parishes. There is the, what's called Shap Urban Parish, which is the village itself. And then there is the Shap Rural Parish, which is the landscape around the village. And that, that, that incorporates all the, the, the small hamlets and the farms and all that kind of thing that are served by the village. Um, and so I decided that I would limit my the project to that area, Shap Rural. Um, and that was even in lockdown, as we were, you know, when I started the project in January, we were in lockdown. Um, I was still able to visit those locations because I could go by foot. I didn't have to drive to, yeah. to many of these locations. Um, and so the project then became, a, a you know, a, an effort for me to kind of showcase this, this area where I live, which is, it's not in the Lake District, but it has a natural beauty all of its own. Um, and, you know, you and I visited one of those locations when we were filming the course for eye photography. We actually filmed the black and white um, module at Shap Abbey, which is yeah. one, of the, one of the locations for my project. Um, and it's, it, it, it's, a, it's an area that I think is very much overlooked by visitors to the Lake District. And so this is what I meant when I talk about projects having an additional purpose. You know, what I want to do is use it as an opportunity to kind of showcase this area in a positive light and to attract more visitors to here um, to come and enjoy, you know, what we have because it's, it's, it's unique. Yeah, I, I think that's nice that you've also pointed out within that is that you don't have to go a million miles away. You could do this, you know, in your town, you know, even if you live in a city, you can look at it as an urban landscape, but you, you prove that you, you don't have to kind of go out driving, you could just walk to these locations. So it doesn't have to be um, time heavy, you know, it doesn't have to have a massive demand, as long as you've got a clear idea on what you're trying to achieve, then you can do it fairly locally, can't you? Yeah, oh, absolutely. And the great thing about projects is that you are completely in control of the parameters that you set for yourself. So what I think what becomes really interesting about photography is when we start to place limitations upon it. So you, if you go onto YouTube, you will see countless videos about shooting with just a 50 millimeter prime lens and what mm. have you. And that's, that's when photography starts to become interesting and that's it starts to become interesting in a, in a different way. Yeah. Uh, when you see how different people deal with different restrictions that are placed upon them as a, yeah. as a photographer and, and, the, and the creative ways they approach that. And that's what projects do because you define in order to, order to have a centralized theme, you immediately place restrictions on the, the type of subject that you're going to shoot or the locations that you're going to shoot or, you know, that the way the image is going to be presented. So, I mean, if you're a, predominantly a color photographer, then, you know, it, it could be very interesting to try to put together a project that is purely shot in black and white. Mm. And, and that, that's nice, actually. That's quite an interesting way, because I'm sitting here thinking digital photography has so much accessibility these days, you know, with, with most cameras, you know, with a standard zoom lens, you can pretty much shoot wide, you can shoot close, you can mm -hmm. shoot black and white, you can shoot color all in your camera, you can do so many different things in one camera. But if you start to take some of those aspects away, you know, if you start to self impose rules, like you said, maybe it's just only shooting at 50 millimeters, only shooting in black and white, etc. as well, it becomes it's a, it's a challenge, but it's a more enjoyable challenge. But you know, what does a project for you as a photographer, how does it differ in kind of single shot thinking? You know, what does it do for you either you know, just for your photography or your approach to it, et cetera? How does it change you? I think the biggest, the biggest thing for me, the biggest thing, the biggest way that projects impact me as a photographer is the purpose. It gives me additional purpose. It gives my photography additional purpose. And that really helps with motivation. 
So I'm sure that many people listening can relate to this. The, the motivation for any artist or anybody work, working or, or, or you know in, in a creative genre um, will find ebbs and flows within their motivation for, for something. Um, and motivation is something that I have struggled with, you know, in the past. Um, and it's not just something that comes from my photography. It's something that came from my professional life as well. And, and I would have um, incredible highs where I was incredibly productive and I would produce exceptionally good work. And this is in uh, my, my IT career, perhaps less so my photography <laughs> career. Uh, but I would, I would just, you know, be very, very creative in what I was producing and, and, and you know, be very great. But then I would have dips. Um, where I, I wasn't able to deliver anything. And this is something that has, has come across into, into my photography. And what I find projects do, they, it helps to flatten that out. Uh, and it helps to keep me motivated. So this year uh, um, has involved me visiting um, one of the 12 locations that I have chosen for my project at least once a week. So the aim is to try to visit each location at least once a season. Um, so that means visiting each location four times a year at a minimum, 12 locations, 48 uh, shots. So that's essentially a year with four weeks yeah. off. And so even though for the larger, and I, I was struggling for motivation at the beginning of the year, it was, you know, we were in lockdown, it was difficult. But I, I, you know, I have gone out and I've still got all of these shots. You know, I've still carried on with the project, so it's helped that motivation. Yeah. And now I'm actually entering into the final um, third you know we're, in, we're we're filming this in September, so I've now I'm now working on my final four images f for the set of twelve. You know I, I'm I'm far less inclined to give this up now mm. because I already have uh, two thirds of it under my belt. Yeah, I, I think that's a that's a human thing, isn't it? In a way that you could give it's like a, a New Year's resolution um, that they say most new year's resolutions are given up by mid February um, mm -hmm. because you look at the whole year ahead and you think, Oh God, you know, I've done six, seven weeks. It, 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 there's like, you know, another 40 odd to go and get to give up. But if you've got past, well, you're at least past the halfway stage. You're now kind of like 70, 75% there. Mm -hmm. You want to see something complete, especially when you've put so much effort into it already. Yeah. That it's less likely that by the summertime, if you've been, you know, if it's a year long project, you're not going to give it up. So, and again, the, the time constraints, don't need to be a year do they they, they could i mean no, is not it, at all is it not something i mean i think i'm jumping questions a little bit here about what because i wanted to come on to this anyway but whilst we're at the point but you, you could do it could you do it over a weekend in a way i mean it, yeah I, I think you can i think you can do it i think you could probably do it in a single setting i think probably one of the one of the strongest um most, most kind of traditional um, ways of presenting a project on multiple images is, is a triptych yeah. You know, a series of three images and, you know, triptychs, whatever the plural <laughs> is, uh, they, they have, you know, they are essentially presenting three images that have a central theme. And that's the core of what a project is. Mm. Um, and they so the, you can you can shoot a triptych in, in, a, in an afternoon. And mm. that's that's a project. That's a very valid thing. And the thing about projects is that the the the, the, the sum of the individual parts is, you know, is greater. Uh, although the whole is greater than some of the individual parts, I think it's what they say. And uh, so what you're, you're what you're doing is you're creating you know, something that has 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 more meaning. And even if that's just three images, the yeah. great thing about triptych. If anybody's thinking about getting into a project, they want to do one, do a triptych first, and try and tell a story with three images. Try yeah. and tell a story with a beginning, a middle, and an end. Oh. And there's a beautiful symmetry there. Yeah. And so I think that's that's one for, 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 for people who are thinking about a project to do. The worst thing I think you can do with projects is get too ambitious too yeah. soon. Well, that, that was kind of one thing I was going to ask actually previously that, A, who do you think a project would be good for uh, in terms of like, you know, for photographers? Do you need, do you think they would necessarily need to have a decent level of experience about photography or could you literally pick up a camera day one, kind of go for it? Or do you think there's, there's got to be a little bit of understanding first? I think that I, I think that projects really are suitable for anybody at any point within their photography. But I would make this observation that if you're going to be set yourself the challenge of being having uh, doing an ambitious project and a, a project that involves a lot more of your time uh, over an extended period of time, then I do feel 
that that is more suited to a photographer who has um, began to establish their style, if you if you know what I mean. The pro the, the thing about you know being a, a novice photographer is that if you dedicate a lot of time to it, your learning curve is going to be huge. So if you if you say right, I'm going to be I, I've been just say you've been doing photography for two years and say, right, I'm going to do a year long project. You go out and shoot every weekend to create a set of images that's going to be a project. The difference between the project, the photos that you took at the start and the, pho the photos that you took at the end will be different. So I think that's very important. So I think, and <laughs> to be fair, that's actually probably quite an interesting project to do and the, the evolution of an of a, of a, of a inexperienced photographer. But if you're trying to put together a series of images that follow a very similar narrative, have a very similar look and feel, I do think that it's important um, that you have that level of experience that allows you to produce consistent work. Yeah. So if you are a novice photographer and you're interested in projects, I would suggest picking something that has, is a smaller in scope, like a triptych or, you know, uh, um, you know, a series of images that tell the story about a single event. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, that, that's a good point because the other thing I wanted to talk about was consistency and, and how you achieve it more so in the editing suite. So when you've got your images, are you editing images, say for like your 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 um, your 21, 2021 projects, you know, these 12 images, are you editing them with any type of similar consistency or do you treat them all individually and it's more about the content, the story of the image as opposed to the look? I, I have, um, I, I think it does help. And the way that we post-process our images is not, and obviously style isn't just about how we post-process, but it's, it's about how we, what we photograph, how we photograph, how we compose our images, the type of light that we like to use. Um, so, for example, you know, as a landscape photographer, I typically use uh, a lot softer light um, and a lot um, softer conditions than than you would expect, perhaps. Um, I'm not a big skies man. I'm not a big sort of orange, pink skies man. I use softer light often working in overcast conditions. And so that starts to create a style. If you look at my images, they, they have a similar look and feel. And then I do process them in a similar way. Obviously, each image is individual and you process it in uh, specifically for that image. But there is a series of steps that I follow and I do certain things. I tone my images are the same. Um, I, you know, I, I'm, I like to push um, mid-tone contrast into my images to give them extra punch, typically because I'm shooting in, mm. in, in situations where there is a lack of contrast. And so they do start to have a look and, a look and feel yeah. uh, to them, which I think is consistent. And, that, and that's just, it's just how I produce my work. Indeed. I mean, with the images afterwards, I know we talked about a triptychs and, and yeah, you could just kind of post these images up online or print them out. But you know, what, what do you do with your images afterwards or when you've I know you're kind of still in the midst of your projects, so you've not finished them yet. But what are you going to do with them afterwards? How are you going to present them and make sure people see them as a project? What's your plans? So I think that the, the first thing that I that I will do is I will put something on my website. So there will be a page on my website. Uh, it will show the finished project. Um, I probably won't try and tell the story of the project. I will just present the work. Um, so th th that's, and I think that's what anyone can do that, you know, um, put, put that on their website. Beyond that, you know, the, my choice of 12 images, it's 12 for a reason. And, that's what it's called, and it, you know, it translates very well to a calendar. So yeah. there will be a calendar uh, at some point. The disadvantage of running a January to December project, if you're trying to produce a calendar, is you can't do the calendar until the following year. <laughs> uh, so it won't be my 2022 calendar. It'll probably be my 2023 calendar, but, you know, so be it. Yeah. Um, I will also produce a zine um, of the project. Um, and in that respect, um, I will um, share a bit more of the journey. So that will involve sharing images. And the, the great thing about a zine or a book is that you can share more images. Um, but there will be some stories to go along with the project and, and that will be about the project itself. 
Um, and but the, 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 ultimately, what I would like to do is I would like to have an exhibition in the village where I live and to share these images with the people that live in this village um, and to, to look at and just say that just look at the landscape that's around you because I don't feel we talk about you know people coming to the Lake District and sort of <laughs> driving straight past, but I don't I feel that there are people in the village that don't appreciate you know what's on the doorstep. Yeah, so the exhibitions I, are definite. I, I think that's 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 so true that yeah, you live in one place long enough, it just becomes white noise to you that you just you see it every day and you don't register how how pretty it is. I think a, an exhibition would be a lovely lovely way, especially selling. You know, if you can sell a calendar locally as well, um, people love to be able to have views that they you know they either aspire to or they completely recognise. Um, I think it's like one or another. So having something that you, know, you can sell to your local audience, you know, your local market, mm -hmm. and it just kind of establishes yourself as a photographer. I think if anybody's listening to to, to kind of this podcast, it, it's a very, very good kind of place to start really to make yourself a, a little bit more known and also make a, a bit of money out of your photography as well. I mean, I know it may not make you a millionaire, but it's... it's <laughs> something off the back of all your hard work that you put into it isn't it yeah and i also think it opens up other doors i mm. think we as, as, as photographers we're in, in inherently curious people i think there's something that i think that that curiosity about the the world and and, and the world around us i think is something that we see from, from one person one photographer to the next um and i think it opens up a lot of doors so what i i'm not going to sort of try, commit to anything here but I hope to be able to use that project as a finished thing uh, to get me access to stuff I might not otherwise have access to. <laughs> that was so specific. <laughs> it was, wasn't it? <laughs> it well, was. Gonna... I've got a few ideas. <laughs> we're going to have to like redo this one in a year and basically see if that thing and that stuff all came together. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and see what it translated to. Because it's good, <laughs> yes, to say, because you're not at the end of your project yet. So you know, having, you know, the outcome of it all, you never know what's going to happen, as you say, but it'd be nice to know, you know, did it pay off for you effectively, yeah. really? But, I mean, looking a little bit more widely, because uh, I know we've been talking about your your project specifically, Chris, do you have any kind of favourite photography projects you've ever seen online that, you know, other friends of yours have done or other photographers that you've seen, anything that you kind of caught your attention that people could listen to and go, oh, yeah, that's maybe a good little idea to start, or I could do that? Um, I think... Uh, you know the, the the projects that I typically I, I've, I've worked on other projects with other photographers. One of the ones I like is um, is, a, is a nine by nine. No, it's not. It's a three by three uh, grid. Uh, so um, it, specifically, going out to create a grid of nine images uh, that are arranged in their square images arranged in a in a knots and crosses grid. Almost. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and what, what's really interesting about that project is that you have to think about how the image sits in the final nine. And what you're trying to do is to you know, fit a composition into a particular spot of the grid. And I find that really, really interesting. So if you have something that has a very, very, very central uh, composition, then that works very well in the middle square. Yeah, but you can't do that all the way through. You know, no, you've got to have ones that are left weighted. Exactly, exactly that, Stephen. Exactly that. Um, and so I think that's a really nice one. And there are some, there are some really nice little companies these days that do these these kind of uh, four uh, eight by eight inch tiles that you stick to the wall. Yes. And so you can produce a grid that you can display, and it it, it looks great, and it, it looks different, and it's very much of the Instagram kind of. Ooh, generation yeah. in the square format instagram obviously invented the square format <laughs> but <Absolutely>. the way <laughs> that it, <laughs> but the way that it's displayed it looks very kind of of that yeah world um and of course when you're displaying images on a wall in that way you have to you know pick images that, that kind of relate so i think that's a really really good idea yeah. um i think that most of the most of the kind of big projects that have inspired me have been professional landscapers producing books and i think that if you are interested in projects and and the way that that people bring images together to tell a story or a narrative of a place or an event or what have you then um i do think that getting your hands on you know picking your favorite landscape photographer finding their book typically it will be on a theme it would be a place my favorite probably one of my favorites 
probably my favourite, is, is Michael Kenner, who's a black and white, he's a British photographer, black and white um, film photographer. He is based in Seattle, in, 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 uh, uh, in Washington State these days, I think, in, in the US, but he will travel to places like Cambodia and what have you, and, and he will create books and then the, become exhibitions and that kind of thing. Um, so they're great. But the, the other one I think that's kind of really, it really, really inspired me to and what really inspired me to get into to projects was the was the work of the great life photographers. So Life magazine was a sort of general comment magazine. It was a it was kind of a popular culture magazine in, in, in the US. I don't think it re, it's running anymore. It's certainly not running in, the, in it was. I think it's it's uh, kind of heyday was around the the 30s, 50s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s in, in US, and that that time in, in US culture that were, where things were going you know, crazy. We, they were going to war. They were going to the moon, the birth of Hollywood, or the, you know the, the, the movies coming through and, and with the talkies and what have you. And it's the concept of a photo essay, hmm. and taking a series of images to tell a story, and the you know obviously it's a very emotive medium photography and it, but it can be difficult to tell a story with a single image. And I've became fascinated um, by how you can combine multiple images, to tell a, a, tell a better story. And I think the photo essay is a dying art and it's something that I would like to see come back. And so I've done a few photo essays of my, of my own and they, and I think that they, you know, they really do, um, it's, it's a really nice way of, of, of using your images and, and rather than just showing a single one on Instagram, you know, creating an essay, a photo essay that you, you put out there. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's a good challenge. And I mean, I was sitting here thinking about other, other, other projects that you could do, other kind of ways that you could kind of uh, see it. And, and I kind of, um, the one that I started almost completely, completely by accident, never thought of it. So I bought a camera, um, it was a Fuji X100, uh, X100S, I think it was a couple of years ago. And I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it has a fixed lens. It's uh -huh. a fixed 23 mil lens. Um, so it goes to like uh, F2, but the aperture is not fixed, but the, the focal length is. So you are, I mean, it's a crop sensor. So it, it's like, it's about basically like 35 mil. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a street, it's a street photographer's camera. It is. And, you know, and I, I love the design of it. I read the reviews and I wasn't so that much bothered about the, the, the focal length, etc. And I looked at it and I thought, great, it's never going to get any sensor dust because I can't take the bloody lens off. <laughs> like, that's a great start to begin with. And it taught me so much more about thinking about the composition and sometimes just about walking away from the composition because I physically couldn't get closer and obviously I couldn't rely mm -hmm. on a zoom. So every single shot I had was always at this effectively uh, equivalent 35 mil. Um, so it wasn't ever kind of a project and the, the, the images aren't necessarily consistent in any sense because I used it for years, but um, the, the camera itself presented that type of challenge in a, in, a, in a different way. So sometimes, yeah, maybe just like using the same lens over and over again, or shooting the same type of scene over and over again from different examples, from different angles. There's, there's so many different ways that you can kind of create a project. And I think uh -huh. that's everything you've talked about is, is so kind of uh, useful for people getting into it to understand the value of it. Yeah. We talked about, we touched on Instagram, didn't we? When I was jokingly talking about the grid, but there's a, there's become a real uh, trend for people to take on the 365 mm. project, which is essentially involves taking an image every day of the year and sharing it onto Instagram and, and kind of documenting uh, your life. And, you know, we talked uh, um, in the, in the last podcast about uh, how you fit photography into your life. And that, that's another great way of, you know, yeah. of doing that. And, and just, re just recording the narrative of your life, taking very interesting little snippets mm -hmm. and, and sharing that uh, onto Instagram. And, and by the end of it, you've got, you know, 365 images. Yeah. And you've got all those memories. And I, I think the more and more you go into it, if you're shooting every day, doing something like that, you get more invested uh, in it. You, you don't want to let yourself down by missing a day and you don't want an image to be posted just for an image's sake, really. So you, you start to kind of think about it a little bit more, maybe kind of partway through the subject, this, this kind of um, this project, you're actually thinking, right, hang on, maybe I try this a little bit differently now, or maybe I add in a different technique because I want to look a bit better. And, and hopefully you should be able to look back on that project, whether it is 365 images or you're shooting just, you know, uh, one once a month for 12 months, be able to look back on it and you've seen how you grow as a photographer, not just the, the point of the project, but, you know, as you as a photographer, it's made you better. Mm. 
And I think, yeah, I think that's the, the point. The great thing that people should look at it. Really a good about. point. I think we, we talked about earlier about how um, it's important if you want to do an extended period of time that you need some experience in order to produce a set of photographs that have a similar feel to them and a similar theme to them. But if you are an inexperienced photographer, a, th a project like the Insta3 uh, 365 is a brilliant one because it will show that evolution of you as a photographer. Mm. And that is fascinating. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. fascinating. And it's one of those things that you can never go back and do again no. because you're only a novice once. Well, that's it. Yeah. You've, you know, by the end of that year, you may have kind of moved up a few steps in terms of your, obviously your experience, but your skill as well. And, well, it, and also, I think that's inevitable, isn't it? Because yeah. that's the one thing that you need to do in order to become a good photographer is to take lots of pictures. And not many people, um, you know, you take you shoot image by image by image, but you know, shooting so consistently as you know, if you would over a year, it kind of documents, as you say, obviously the, the scenes that you're shooting, but that photographer as well, it's almost like a self portrait, uh, in, in a non standard way that it's showing how that person behind the camera, the viewpoint, their thinking, and that's that's an interesting thing because nobody ever really kind of you know photographs the, the photographer, you know, the, yeah, it's obviously always the one behind the camera, but but um, but yeah, either way, I think, um, I think we've we've kind of covered everything in there and there is a little bit more information about projects and there was a few other projects that I'd had in mind that I'd seen online which I'd covered previously in another podcast so if you jump back quite a few episodes and, and look for a previous podcast show that's got uh, projects in the title there's a little bit more information in there that we talked about but um, I, I, I have to be honest Stephen and I, I hope you don't but I think I missed that one um that that podcast obviously i've listened to all of them so i must have missed that one somehow did you talk about adobe behance in that no uh, podcast okay so i think if you really want to go and find some examples of good projects that people that photographers have done um then i would advise you to go and have a look at adobe behance and uh, we'll leave a description in the show notes for that. And um, it's a platform obviously run by uh, Adobe. Um, and it's a way for uh, photographers to showcase the projects that they've been working on. And there's projects where all different uh, genres of photography, uh, digital art uh, in there as well. And it's open. So if you if you create a project yourself, you're able to, to, to kind of share it on there as well. It's a kind of it's kind of like a social media site for, for photography projects and if you're looking for inspiration or you you know you want to get some ideas then that's a really really good resource so yeah adobe behance there we go brilliant fantastic little tip to end with as well well thank you very much again uh chris um again all the links uh, will be in the description for anything we've been talking about today as well um and i hope see if you've not caught any previous episodes about our little landscape photography series that we've been doing recently then please go back and listen um, there's tons of such valuable advice that Chris has got about being a landscape photographer and making that transition or just making a little bit more out of your landscape photography uh, and making some money out of it potentially and balancing work and life with it as well loads of different things we've been talking about and there's still more to come as well so uh, make sure you're subscribed to whatever you're listening to this podcast whether it's on Spotify or, or Apple or wherever you get your uh, great podcasts from and there'll be more from myself and Chris in the future so thank you very very much again Chris for another wonderful show and we'll see everybody on the next episode hopefully thank you